And last but not least, we have a philosopher talking to us, our, our, our token philosopher. We have to have a philosopher. So uh, it's uh, uh, Robert Coons uh, is professor of philosophy uh, in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Texas uh, at Austin. He specializes in philosophical logic and in the application of logic to the longstanding, to, uh, longstanding philosophical problems, including metaphysics, philosophy of mind, and intentionality, semantics, political philosophy, and metaethics, and the philosophy of religion. His, books par his book, Paradoxes of Belief and Strategic Rationality, uh, received the Arlt Prize from the Council of Graduate Schools in 1994. He's the author of Realism Regained and the co-editor of The Waning of Materialism. He is at work with uh, Tim uh, Pickavance on a textbook on metaphysics. He is working on analytic Aristotelianism and social ontology. Th th I don't understand what any of that means. <laughs> but um, but <laughs> he's uh, going to talk to us today about are probabilities indispensable to inferring design. It's been terrific. It's a real, a real honor to be here. I, People often say they're humbled by an invitation. I never really knew what that meant until I got here and looked at the program for this meeting and realized uh, what an eminent group of distinguished people I'm, I'm on this program with. And uh, I hope I, uh, well, I, I know what it feels like to be the weak, weak link in a, in a chain now. Uh, so um, I'm part of, as, as Steve said, I'm a philosopher. I'm part of that long fellowship that's been working 2,500 years and accomplished absolutely nothing. So, <laughs> but, the one thing you can say about us is we're not quitters, right? <laughs> Just uh, wait till you see the next 2,500 years. Uh, that's uh, that's we're really going to turn the corner. Uh, but now, seriously, um, you know, we've talked a lot. Obviously, we've talked a lot this this uh, weekend about faith and science, and I want to make sure that we get reason in there as well, and that we understand that. Uh, that reason is, is more than just science, right? The science is a part of reason, but reason goes beyond that. And uh, you know, I particularly want to talk about uh, uh, evidence for God's existence, or arguing for God's existence, as a part of that rational uh, task. And, and as Catholics, I think we're, we should believe that, uh, that our uh, reason is capable of, of distinguishing the existence of God, and even of understanding the character of God, uh, his, his wisdom. Um, now, of course, among, among Catholic philosophers, there's uh, disagreements, and I think probably the majority will say, uh, although our arguments for God's existence have to be based on experience, they should really be independent of scientific results. I think that's what most Thomists would say. So I'm in the minority who would say, no, I think I'm fine with that. I'm all, I'm all for arguments that are independent of scientific results. I've done a lot of work on them myself. I'm very interested in first cause kind of arguments. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think our quiver should be as full of arrows as we can. Uh, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. If you have scientific ev evidence that points towards God's existence, you know, bring it on. Let's, uh, let's include it in our, in our panoply. So, uh, so with a sort of death wish of uh, bringing up uh, the arguments that really do depend on science in, in a group of scientists who know the science infinitely better than I do, uh, that's what I'm going to try and talk about today. Uh, so uh, let's see. Yes, um, talked about that really good. So uh, in, in the question, I'm really going to focus on this question of whether we can detect uh, design detect purpose or intelligence in nature. And that, of course, raises two questions. One is, well, what is design or purpose or intelligence? And then secondly, which is a metaphysical question, and then secondly, well, how would we go about detecting it if there were such thing? That's an epistemological question, a question of knowledge. Uh, for reasons of time, I'm not going to say anything much about the metaphysical question. I'll just say I'm going to give a very minimal understanding here of purpose or intelligence, that intelligence is whatever orders means to an end. And so that's a very broad, very minimal understanding. Uh, by, that, by that token, uh, by that understanding, even well, natural selection itself would count as intelligent. It does order means to ends. So it's a very broad conception here of intelligence. But I want to focus more on the epistemological idea, which is how do you detect design? How exactly uh, do we discover that? And that actually falls, well, it's, as I say, it's an epistemological question. But I like to think of it also as a um, question in philosophy of logic. That is. We all have a capacity to, to, to detect design and purpose. We do that all the time. We detect purpose in each other's actions. We detect purpose in, in people's writings, right? Uh, we do it in, uh, in fields of science as well, criminology, hist history, archaeology, and so on. Uh, so we have a capacity. And what philosophical logicians then try to do is to develop formal models of that inference which will then match the phenomena. That is, it will give the right answers where it's clear what the right answers are. And then hopefully in those cases where it's not so clear what the right answers are, the model will give us some guidance. So that's, that's the basic task. 
Now, uh, many philosophers, perhaps most, who work on this field uh, bring in probability theory here as a way of understanding this. Because clearly, the inference to design from evidence is a kind of inductive inference. It's not deductive, right? We have to take evidence and somehow infer the, the cause. It's, it's a version of what uh, philosophers going back to Peirce call abduction, where you, you have a set of uh, things that you think may be an effect of a common cause, and you're trying to infer the cause on the basis of those effects. And probability has been a useful way of thinking about this, especially Bayes' theorem. Now, I think in some cases, it's very clear that probability theory is, is indispensable. If you're testing a hypothesis which is itself probabilistic, as in quantum mechanics or in, in uh, uh, physiology or you know, you're trying to determine what the odds, what the chances of getting cancer are from smoking. In those sort of cases, obviously you need probability theory in order to infer the probabilistic hypothesis. But what if the hypothesis is in itself probabilistic? Like you're trying to figure out whether uh, Shakespeare really did fail to give an objective correlate to, the, to Hamlet's emotions or whether the Egyptians are building pyramids for the sake of, uh, of honoring their kings or whatever, right? Then it's not so obvious that probability is actually needed. Although, nonetheless, many philosophers have argued that we should use it. The worry, I think, from my perspective, is that probability introduces a sort of unnecessary shuffle here. That is, we start with some unpro unprobabilistic data. Probability theory forces us to, add some, to, to assign some numbers to this, to this data. Then we can try to get through Bayes' theorem, and it gives us a probabilistic answer, which we then have to convert back into the qualitative question of whether to believe something or not. And so the question is whether all that probabilistic machinery is actually adding something. That's, that's really the task that I wanted to look at today. So we're going to talk about um, uh, an indirect sort of inference of design, of course. And I'm going to talk about, uh, real briefly, some probabilistic models, and then sketch what I'm going to offer as a very speculative, non-probabilistic alternative. I'm calling the Aristotelian diamond. And then hopefully, if I have some time, I will apply uh, two of those models, one of the probabilistic ones in my own model, to the case of fine-tuning, uh, at least to uh, of, of the fundamental constants of, of the universe, of the laws of nature, that's what I have in mind here. Um, good, so, um, so one model that's often used is a Bayesian approach, the design inference. Uh, Richard Swinburne, uh, Robin Collins, and others have, have offered this one. So in this case, we have, uh, this should be familiar, the uh, Bayes' theorem. Uh, we'll th take E to be the evidence that we observe, H to be the hypothesis of design. There's some sort of designer involved. And, um, and then you, uh, you can compute that probability based on the converse probabilities. So here we really just need three independent parameters. We need to know the probability of H itself. What's the prior probability of the design hypothesis? We need to know the probability of E on H. That is, given this designer, how likely would it be that we see the evidence that we see? I've actually got a four-page handout, so if you want to pick it up and get all these equations afterwards, you can do that. So don't feel like you have to get all this down on, on your notes. Uh, and then finally, you need the probability of E on not H. That is, how unlikely is this evidence given not H? And of course, if the probability of E on not H is really low, which is what we hope if we're trying to confirm a hypothesis, then if it's close to zero, then you'll see that the numerator and the denominator end up being exactly the same, and the resulting ratio is very close to one. Right? And so it doesn't really matter that much how high probability H is or E on H, as long as they're not too low, right? Uh, everything is fine. And then so long as probability E on not H is extremely low. Right? So the difficulties, of course, with the Bayesian model, if we do it literally, is that all these numbers are pretty difficult to determine. And in particular, how do we judge the prior probability of a designer? What's the prior probability of God's existence you know, prior to looking at all this evidence? Well, uh, you know, may maybe we have the first cause argument or something to tell us it's one, right? But uh, <laughs> otherwise, it may be really difficult to, to assign a number to that. So the second sort of approach, which uh, Robin Collins and others have also suggested, is called the likelihood ratios approach. In this case, you don't have to go through the whole Bayes' theorem, and you really just have to look at two numbers now. You compare the probability of E on H versus the probability of E on not H, right? And again, so long as that second number is really, really low, like nearly zero, and the other one is significantly greater, you know that evidence is confirming the, pro the probability of the hypothesis, right? So you hope, the hope is that whatever we see when E is going to be something that's astronomically, so to speak, unlikely, right, given uh, the absence of a designer, something that you wouldn't expect to see with a designer, whereas, well, you might expect, you might see it if there is a God. And so that, that left-hand side is, is considerably greater 
Uh, so this is fine. In fact, this is related very much to the Newman uh, Pearson kind of test in, in statistics. But we still need these two parameters. And the probability of E on H is still pretty difficult to compute if you think about it. So I have to think about, well, suppose there's a god. What's the probability that a god would produce a universe like ours with the sort of constants that we see, a life-preventing universe, let's say? Well, who knows, right? I mean, we don't really have that much insight into the, I don't know, the probabilistic psychology of God, right? Which is roughly what we would need to, to apply this number. And so it's, it's difficult. Um, now, if you make H really specific, like the, world, the universe has been designed by a life-loving God who wants to do it by means of physics and so on, uh, then maybe you can make the probability of E on H pretty high, but now it's looking awfully ad hoc. It's as if you've just invented this hypothesis to fit whatever data you're seeing, and it's not so clear that you can legitimately infer it in that case. Now, finally, there's a sort of classical approach here, which goes back to uh, Fisher and, uh, uh, and others, where you just, we're just going to be concerned with rejecting hypothesis based on the idea that the evidence that we see is really, really unlikely given that evidence. So now we're paring down. We've, we've thrown away two of the three parameters from the Bayes' theorem, and now we're just left with the probability of E on not H. And we're saying, look, if that's really, really low, then we reject the idea that the world is undesigned, which sort of leaves us with design is a, by process of elimination, right? And it's sort of inspired by Karl Popper's falsificationism, and it's really the method that's used quite typically in classical statistics. It's how statistical hypotheses are tested and sometimes rejected on the basis of this approach. But it has two obvious problems. One is, it seems that it's going to gen generate lots of false positives, because we don't want to infer design whenever we see any low probability event whatsoever. Lots of un unlikely things are going to happen necessarily. And secondly, how do we give a non-arbitrary value to lambda in this case? Is it 0.05, is it 0.01, is it one in a billion, one in 10 to the 50th power, or whatever? It's, it's sort of hard to see where we draw the line. Now, um, William Dembski in his book, uh, Design Inference, uh, has a couple of proposals here. And uh, I think it's unfortunate, really, that uh, Dembski's work got kind of caught up in the whole ID controversy in the, in the uh, 90s and early 10s, because I think there's some really useful work in this, in this book. Came out in a very uh, prestigious series, actually, in Cambridge University Press. On, on how to uh, recognize design probabilistically. I'm, I'm ultimately going to reject it, but still, I, with, I, I reject it with a lot of respect. I think it's an interesting proposal. And his thought is, and I'm simplifying a little bit what he does in chapter five, is that you take an event and you complete it or saturate it in a certain way, which is you look at all the events which have the same or lower degrees of, of computational complexity. And so here's where he, he's introducing Kolmogorov uh, information theory and sort of wedding it with Shannon information theory. So two different information theories being combined simultaneously. And you look at the event E and you ask, well, what are all the other events that have the same or less degree of, of, of algori algorithmic complexity, which you could measure by how, how uh, long, a, what's the shortest program that you can use in a Turing machine to generate a description of the event, right? What's, you look at all events that have a, 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 the same or lower degree of complexity and the same or lower degree of probability, and you disjoin all those together to get one gigantic event. If that a gigantic event is still really, really unlikely, extremely unlikely, then that triggers an inference to some sort of design. So for him, it has to be less than 1 over d, where d is the number of events in cosmic history, something like 10 to the 150th power, so a very high number. Now, in the case we're looking at with uh, fine-tuning, there's just one universe, so D is just one. <laughs> so in this case, all we have to do is compare the number to uh, one over two, to one half. And if, if the result is less than one half, that would trigger some sort of design inference in the case in which we're interested. Okay, here's just a quick example of that. Um, if you had uh, just a sort of random uh, set of five cards, so to speak, in poker, the algorithmic complexity is quite high, you know, even given all the rules of poker, something like 28 bits of information. Whereas if I have a royal flush, uh, the, the, the information is, the algorithmic information is much lower, like three bits of information there to describe that hand. Uh, whereas you know, to a, a, a pair, well, it's a bit less, it's a little, a little less complex than a random hand, about 24 bits rather than 28 in this particular case. Um, now if, uh, let's say that just, I'm just picking kind of random number here. Let's say there are a billion cases of poker deals in the history of the world, if you want a trillion, whatever, we can, we can expand it. Um, now, the, the, the probability of the specific, specificational completion of E1, this sort of nondescript hand, is basically going to be one, because every hand in poker has 
at least as much complexity as this or less, and is, and is mo no more likely than this. So the completion is just one, and you'll never trigger uh, design no matter how, how often you see that particular hand. On the other hand, uh, the uh, specificational completion of, of the royal flush is about uh, 1.54 times 10 to the minus fourth, according to Wikipedia, I hope. Uh, and so uh, if we saw four royal flushes in a row, that should trigger some sort of design inference. It would be more than likely than not that somebody has arranged these, uh, this deal in order to produce those particular hands. Uh, with, with pairs, it would take 40 pairs in a row before you were in a position where you could legitimately uh, do that. Now, there's still a problem, right, which is how do you calculate the probability of E given not H if, let's say, we're, we're interested in the probabilities about E, where E is the, is the, are certain values, well, the values of the fundamental constants of nature falling within the life permitting zones. Okay, that, that's the E we're looking at here, right? How do you, how do you compute those probabilities? I mean, Dr. Barrow said well, nobody knows how to do that, and I, I agree. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty challenging. And then second, the second problem is Kolmogorov or algorithmic complexity is really a measure of the complexity of a description of an event rather than of the fact itself. And so I'd like to move from that to a more ontological measure of the complexity of the fact itself. So that's the proposal I'm going to suggest. Um, now, suppose Dembski's approach works from a philosophical logic point of view. That is, so let's suppose that it roughly gets the right answers here as to when we can detect design and when we can't. Why is that? Well, an event can be specified or described in many ways, but the most common, I think, are to describe the event in terms of its causes, its own internal structure, or its effects. And so the question is, how can you get an event that's both very unlikely and also has a very simple description? Well, it's actually, I think, difficult to see how you can get an event which is really unlikely and which has a, a simple set of causes or a simple internal structure. Because if the causes and the, and the structure are simple, those events are going to tend to be, have, have, occur with a fairly high like, likelihood. On the other hand, if the event has very simple effects, you could specify the event via the effects, even though the causes of that event are such that it has a very low likelihood of occurring. So it seems to me that that's the most likely way, most likely way in which you're going to see this kind of thing happen. And that leads to the ontological uh, approach and what I call the Aristotelian diamond, which I guess you can't quite see that diagram. But the thought here is that you've got a, a diamond shape. Uh, the blue line represents the distinction between what we can observe and what's hypothetical, what we're conjecturing. And we see an extremely complex event or fact. And that complex effect has a quite simple effect, ontologically simple effect. When we see that, I think, it triggers an inference to a common cause, in this case an intelligent or purposeful cause, which brings about this complex event in order to, to produce the simple effect. That's the thought. So the, the idea is that any time that we find a complex fact uh, which is, has a simple effect, complex cause, simple effect, we can infer design. So here's roughly the proposal. Um, if you've got um, a fact S is going to warrant design, just in case there's some fact T, and S causes T, and then the crucial thing is we have to find the simplest version, or the simplest part of S, which is sufficient to cause T. So pare away all the extraneous detail, the stuff that isn't needed in order to produce the effect T. Get down to what we might call the irreducibly complex part of S, right? Once we find that, we then measure the complexity of S versus the measure of the complexity of T. And if the difference between the two complexities is great enough, that triggers a design inference. That's the thought. Uh, now you might think, well, you know, there's obvious problems here. What about, what if a very complex breeze knocks, a, you know, blows a leaf off of a tree? Isn't that a case where you have a very simple effect, very complex cause, nobody wants to infer design? Well, the problem there, I think, is that first we have to pare down the cause to those elements, that part of the cause, which is absolutely necessary to produce the effect. In this case, it's just, it's, all you need to know about the breeze is that it has a certain capacity to, to convey a, a, an adequate amount of momentum or energy to detach the, the, uh, the leaf from the tree. And so in that particular case, the cause and effect are actually roughly equal in terms of their ontological complexity. Okay, now in the case of the uh, anthropic coincidences, still got three or four minutes, so I can go through this real quick. Um, if we apply the probabilistic model, I think first of all, we're to, to try to simplify things a bit, we can just, we're just gonna focus on carbon-based planetary life, right? That's what we're gonna look at. 
And we're going to also look at a, a natural sub-region of our actual universe, right? So we're going we're to exclude all the really exotic universes to begin with, right? Stick with things that are fairly close to our actual universe. And then we're going to focus on the life that we're pretty familiar with too, which is carbon-based planetary life. So if the probability of C given N is really close to zero, and C can be specified in Dembski's sort of sense, then it looks like C should trigger a design inference. We should, we should infer that some designer has produced a universe that is uh, fit for carbon-based life. And so in particular, of course, we have to look at the probabilistic completion of C in order to apply that. And as I said, the one difficulty is the subjectivity of the, of the probabilities here. Where does that come from? Another problem that's been pointed out by several people, but originally I think by Vestrup, McGrew, and McGrew, is there are some technical difficulties here in assigning probabilities to something like the fundamental constants of the universe. Right? And in particular, if a, if a constant lies in, a, in a, a range, a spectrum, that's infinite, so the value could be anything from zero to infinity, then, um, then you can't, there, there is no uniform probability distribution over that infinite set. Uh, you'd have to assign, if you tried to do it, you'd have to assign every finite event the probability zero. And then that means that any kind of finite bound on that constant is going to trigger design because it's going to have a probability zero, right? That uh, no matter how, how broad the, the, the range is. So this is the argument is that, that there's a problem here that it seems that we can't distinguish between broad tuning and fine tuning, coarse tuning and fine tuning, right? They're both going to end up equally good and they're both going to become totally compelling with probability one, basically, because the, the, the results that we see are going to have probability zero. And so that's, that's a technical difficulty which is actually pretty difficult to get around within the probabilistic kind of setting. So my suggestion is we look at the, at the laws of nature themselves. Uh, this has come up a couple times. Uh, you know, you guys are really good at finding the laws of nature, but you're not very good at telling us what it is you found once you got there, right? What exactly is a law of nature? And this is something that we philosophers have been thinking about for quite a long time. And there are a number of sort of interesting proposals that I think it would be helpful for you all to know about and to uh, be familiarize yourself with. Again, for reasons of time, I can't really say a whole lot about them. Um, there's a great textbook on metaphysics that Steve mentioned. I, uh, myself and Tim Figavance has got a whole chapter on this. So uh, uh, metaphysics and fundamentals, I recommend it. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of neo-humus program. Uh, to translate this into theological terms, you might think of this as kind of an occasionalist picture. God just does whatever, and the laws of nature are just really neat, simple or descriptions of what he does. Uh, they happen to fit the facts. Uh, there's the realist picture from uh, Armstrong, uh, Thule, and Dretzky. This is, this is sort of a Occamist uh, picture of, of laws of nature as divine commands. So God sort of formulates an imperative to the world. You know, do this. E, let e equals, equals mc squared or whatever, right? Uh, and in that case, the law of nature itself is some kind of thing built up out of platonic universals or something like them, and actual numbers, right? Uh, embedded in this law of nature, which God or, or whatever, you know, these guys aren't actually theists, I'm just sort of translating it to theological talk. Uh, they just think the law exists by itself somehow. Uh, and then a neo-Aristotelian account, according to which the laws of nature are embedded in the essences of particular things. So the natures of things are what carries the law of nature. But what I think all three models have in common is a certain kind of mathematical Platonism. And that suggests that we could measure the complexity of the law of nature if we could measure the complexity of the numbers themselves. Right? Okay, so this is where it gets very speculative, obviously. And uh, I don't actually know anyone as who's tried to do this uh, other than myself. Um, and again, for reasons of time, I'm just gonna skip to the, the more Platonistic model here where the thought is that the numbers that you see occurring in laws of nature, those entities are actually, they're either actual real numbers or they're something that exists in a domain that's isomorphic to the real numbers. And they have an ontological complexity that also mirrors the ontological complexity of the numbers themselves. What does that mean? Well, um, I think the thought here is that something like, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, that we could say, look, a number like zero or one that's a pretty simple number. Right? Uh, we can give them an ontological complexity of one. Right? Then the other natural numbers get built up from the, those numbers initially by addition. Right? So the complexity of three is probably three, four is four, and so on. We can just, for the small natural numbers, we can go that way. We might think that uh, for numbers that can be factored, uh, the complexity of the number is something like the sum of the complexity of the factors. That seems plausible. 
And uh, if you do that, then you could uh, put a reasonable lower bound on the complexity of a number, a reasonable uh, estimate at something like 2 times log 2 of m for, for fairly large uh, natural numbers as an estimate of the ontological complexity of the numbers that are involved. And um, we could also extend that to the rational numbers. The real numbers are actually an interesting problem. Um, I don't want to say that pi and e are infinitely complex. They're obviously not. So clearly, there's got to be some other way in which those irrational numbers can be, can be constructed in such a way that they can end up with a finite complexity. And that could potentially complicate the story I'm telling quite a bit. But I don't think it'll be a, make, make a huge difference. So if you take a typical law of nature like uh, Newton's law, the thought is that there's something in that law of nature, that g, which corresponds to a real entity with a real, with a real degree of ontological complexity. And what the anthropic coincidences can tell us by giving us information about the ratios between these different constants is it enable us then to put a lower bound on the ontological complexity of the laws of nature themselves. So again, just for reasons of time, let me uh, give you the model. This is the uh, Platonist model. So um, again, these numbers are probably a little out of date. I mean, I'm using uh, uh, stuff that's available for us non-specialists, so, so you can tell me which of those rows are not, uh, not appropriate. But, um, but applying something like my model, you get a total ontological complexity from these five cases of fine tuning of something like 1985. So 1985 metaphysical units, so to speak, are <laughs> built, into, built into constructing these laws of nature. And so then we have to compare that to the ontological complexity of, of carbon-based life. And in, in the full paper, I give you some explanations of why I think it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 50, let's say, for, that, for those properties. And so the gap between 1986 and 50 is a pretty big gap, right? Uh, if you encountered a, a machine on the beach like Paley, had 1950 working parts, one very simple effect, you would infer design. And so it looks to me that we do have pretty good reason here for thinking there's something like design. Um, now, um, this provides at best a kind of prima facie case for design. Right? I'm not saying this is a deductive proof. It's open to rebuttal. And so my thought is that the multiverse is a possible rebuttal to this. Right? So in other words, this provides you with prima facie reason to think, given what we know about the fine tuning, that there's design. But it does seem to me that it shifts the burden of proof now to the agnostic or the skeptic. Right? So now it's the skeptic who has to show that there is a multiverse, and it's the skeptic who now has to result of probability theory. The skeptic who has to show that there's actually a likelihood that, given their mechanism for generating multiverses, there's a high likelihood that you will see a life-permitting universe. And so until they fulfill that burden of proof, I think the reasonable thing to do is to go with the prima facie evidence here and infer design. Okay, I'm out of time, so I'll quit there and leave us some time for questions.